Here is my Tron After Dark 2023 interview with Matthias Hone on The Last Exit, aka Little Bone Lodge. Started, uh, this is your um, second time at Tron After Dark. You were here for uh, mm. Cockings of and Zombies a decade ago, <laughs> which won the audience prize. So, uh, but um, I noticed that the, the Last Exit is like a much darker film than that. So, I wonder if you could talk about what you're aiming for tonally with the film. Well, both my first movies were like genre crossovers. So like Cockneys vs. Zombies, I always like to say is an action adventure with zombies. Mm -hmm. You know, it's got a heist element, but, um, but it's got the horror element as well. And my second movie was like a time travel story um, with martial arts. And um, I always, I love doing those kind of crazy crossover films. But um, at the same time, they're always really difficult to market mm -hmm. and um, to kind of to sell to people. So... Um, I kind of wanted to do something a little bit more simple and straightforward. And, um, and when, um, when the pandemic hit, I was sitting with a friend of mine, Neil Lin Powell, um, who um, is an accomplished short filmmaker and actor. And um, he sort of expressed to me that he really wanted to develop a, a contained film that we could do maybe while everything is going on with, with the pandemic. And, um, and I was really into that idea because I wanted to just sort of, I also wanted to show, you know, that I can make a small film with five actors that is character driven, actor driven and, um, and contained. And um, he pitched me the idea to, um, to Little Bone Lodge and I really latched into, onto that, two criminals on the run. I love criminals as characters and, and then um, getting like, um, getting stuck in the wrong house basically um, and then we developed the script together and you know I think um, he um, we had a great time talking about it and then he went on to um, write the screenplay it's his first feature film scre screenplay and he knocked it out of the park and um, I shared it with my producers um, from Courtney's vs Zombies and they were like yeah we have a we have a deal we can make this happen and um, the rest is history mm -hmm. so uh, maybe we could talk a bit about the um Casting for the film because um, the, um, probably the most recognizable face in the film is um, Jodie Richardson. Uh, so, um, could you talk about um, casting her and uh, developing the uh, character of Ruth? Well, so I've been a fan of Jodie Richardson's ever since Event Horizon. Mm -hmm. um, and then, of course, she's been in Nip Tuck and um, recently Sandman and um, many, many other great TV shows and films. And um, what I was looking for was someone who um, could be both vulnerable and warm and then also tough and um, ice cold and she's sort of really unique in being able to play such a range and I remember sending her the script with a video message and um, she read it and she was a little bit scared of the role because it's such a dark role um, and so sort of out there and it, it, it's you know the character goes on such a big journey um, that she was like um, a little bit afraid, but then ultimately excited about doing it because you know, it meant showing or flexing muscles maybe that she hasn't shown before. And um, um, I think she did an amazing job with it. So the, the, without uh, spoiling too much, of course, um, the film actually um, plays with um, viewers' expectations and that the, the conception of who's the protagonist or antagonist changes over the course of the film and uh, probably the most innocent character of the film is Maisie who I, I described as sheltered yet content <laughs> so um, how would you say that she evolves over the course of the film well it's interesting so um Sadie Soverall, who plays Maisie, um, you know, really blew me away with her audition. Um, she was in um, Fate the Wing Saga on Netflix, but this is her first feature film. And, um, and it was a real honor working with her because she did bring such a heartfelt um, performance and, um, and emotionality to it. And really the character is like, um, is like a, a, a woman that it has not been allowed to grow beyond being a girl. So she's like um, trapped in this house. She's a, a girl in a woman's body. And then in the journey of the film, her innocence and her um, um, the veil in front of her um, vision has been pulled off away and she understands what the world really is and what really has been happening. So she's it's a real, I guess, coming of age, belated coming of age story for her. Her playing... Um, 
to be much younger than she is really what, is what I found really fascinating for the character that you have like a, a girl trapped in the body of a woman really um, and what happens when this this girl finds out um, you know what the rest of the world holds what the world is really like well I think uh, it's interesting that you mentioned girl in the body of a woman because um Pretty much the character of Maddie is boy in a character in the body of a man. So, um, uh, like, like, I'm on the autistic spectrum, so I kind of, like, recognize mm. the signs of the character. So um, could you talk about the character and how he's both mistreated and maybe misjudged? Mm. <laughs> yeah, I think um, the, Matty's character was um, someone we really, really thought about it great length because he's, he's neurodiverse had like a sensitivity advisor yeah. who um, was talking to us about great length how to portray a character like that and um, with learning difficulty basically and um, and I think what was really interesting the takeaway and what um, we all learned as filmmakers and storytellers is that um, um, in mainstream media most of the time when you have a character a neurodiverse character that neurodiversity like let's say you have a character in a soap opera, the neurodiversity becomes like, it's always a, a plot point, a part in the story. You never have a character that um, is just like all of us, where that, that, that aspect of that person's character is, is not talked about. It's just part of who they are and it's not really what drives the story forward. So that's what we try to do with Matty, where, you know, he is neurodiverse, but we don't, we never really talk about it and make a special point out of it. He's just another flawed character, like all of the characters mm -hmm. in the film. So that, that's what I tried to achieve and tried really hard to be respectful, basically, um, of neurodiversity and how to portray a character like that in modern filmmaking. Oh, well, I guess we'll talk a bit about the uh, title change and from, from Little Bone Lodge to uh, The Last Exit. <laughs> yeah, it's interesting, you know, like, um, you know, we've made a small um, indie movie and um, and we were re very lucky that we have um, really good distributors taking care of the film. And um, Saban felt strongly that for the American or North American market, um, they felt like the original title Little Bone Lodge felt too much like a horror movie and too much like The Lodge, um, mm -hmm. which is, a, a you know, a, a well-known <laughs> film and so they they wanted they were they were like we are going to distribute it but we are going to have to take change the title and um we wanted to feel more like a thriller so that's where the last exit came from um so it's a little bit you know i understand and um at the same time of course it would be fun if it's the same title everywhere but then now you have two titles so um yeah. um some people like the last exit better some people like little bone lodge better and such is life such is art so um uh, going full circle it's all about marketing <laughs> unfortunately you know that it's sort of sad to say that um but it is sort of um when you when you make movies and you realize you think that um that it's all about trying to write the story get the budget make the film and that's that's where it stops then you realize oh no that's only half half the journey because then the other journey is um can we get it um distributed marketed can we persuade someone to like put some oomph behind it all of that so it's sort of it is um it's it's that side and you know and that's where festivals like toronto after dark are great because they are you know bringing those films to uh, you know to the yeah. public and, and to the fans and you know i'm really appreciated for that okay yeah. thanks yeah.